go to there we go got the link wonderful wonderful Hassan Piker we're gonna watch the full thing of the Ukraine discussion we're gonna discuss some socialism along the way because it seems like some people need a reminder that actually the failure to Eastern Europe has Marxism pretty well handled on the theoretical level believe it or not countries that were part of the Eastern Bloc actually did some form of Marxist theory which is why ironically enough a lot of dedicated Marxists opposed the regimes in the Eastern Bloc and the Soviet state because they knew that what those countries did had nothing to do with actual Marxist doctrine because they learned the theory. What irony that this system has basically educated its own opponents. Maybe, who knows? Okay, let's to support Ukraine at this critical moment. Let's see. The supposed freaking has weekend. You say Friday. I the whole conversation. Um, I thought you were so going to movie Maestro. You know, so that um, we don't. No, mine is like. So that we don't this miss out on any context. No context missed. We're gonna plow through the whole thing so that we do not insult. Mr. Hassan's intelligence with just clips. As a Polish person, I felt very comfortable with just watching the Polish thing from clips. But you know what? For, for the Ukraine thing, we're going to watch the whole conversation that is being had about Navalny. And I think Avdivka as well. That I, I went to dinner. Austin was paying. And Amazing. I saw some of it. Uh, Beautiful. It's a yes. meme, man. Where does Ukraine but it's begin? Genocide argument. Genocide Joe argument. Okay, let's go. I'll fucking stream. I think treats. it begins with the Biden <clears throat> thing. Ukraine. Anyway. Have I got some lovely materials for you all? To illustrate just how entrenched into the whole Marxism, socialism and everything. Of course, logically speaking, everybody was under the Eastern Bloc. Good afternoon. I, uh, I'm heading off to East Palestine at, at the moment, but I wanted to say a few things this morning about... Let's uh, talk about Russia. Alexei Navalny. You know, like millions of people around the world... I'm, literally... I'm gonna say it real quick. Um, yes. Everyone you... in Russia, everyone involved in Russian politics is uh, Vladimir Putin's guy. Okay. Okay. And just because this guy was not technically Vladimir Putin's guy does not automatically make him a good guy. I mean, that's not how politics necessarily work. Like politics, usually, like only in very extreme examples can you cleanly like divide politics into good guys and bad guys usually it does not work like that it cannot work like that if if it always worked like that you would have you would get nothing done ever you have to compromise with some people it is actually a rare thing to get people like putin in politics to get people like mike johnson in politics to get people like trump like usually you have to accept that the enemy of my enemy, for example, is my ally against, let's say, Putin. So just because Navalny wasn't a good guy, in some respects he was actually an awful guy, like for like when it comes to Crimea and many other things, it doesn't change the fact that he was still, at this point in time, the best shot at opposition that Russia has had. Oh, I guess I answered your question. I guess I answered your question. And yes, his wife has a 
announce that she's going to continue his work, but I'm sad to announce that this has not done any good for the wife of the arrested presidential candidate in Belarus. So we'll see if it does anything for Navalny's wife. Vladimir Putin, very bad guy. We all know that. Alexei Navalny, not a good guy either, okay? Just anti-Vladimir Putin, which is... Okay, so what, what is your point? What point are you trying to make? We all know that. We're not idiots. We all know what the politics of Navalny were. He was mainly, like... Think of the undertones of imperialism were there, of course. We know that. But you don't actually believe in Russian imperialism all that much since you say that by invading Ukraine, Russia is just getting back its territory. So what part of Putin being a bad guy does Navalny have? Since you don't even seem to think that Putin is all that big of a bad guy. Is why, of course, many people immediately jumped on the train of like being like, oh, Navalny, he's so, uh, you know, he's based, he hates Putin. He's like, and then you find out about his like personal opinions on, on xenophobia and racism. And you're like, oh, never mind. Um, <laughs> never mind. But uh... nobody said he was based. People said that he was a workable opposition against Putin, which is also actually questionable, but that is the stance that people take, that he was actually a viable opposition to Putin's regime. And actually, some even put forward the, uh, some even put forward the theory that, uh, that Putin was afraid of the fall of the Tsardom scenario because you know what when you let your enemy live the enemy might not seem dangerous now but it might actually bite you in the ass later like the tsar let lenin off the hook he didn't kill lenin and what happened lenin became a german weapon and basically took down the tsarat so basically putin was thinking well this guy might not be dangerous now the Wagger. But you know what? Later he just might become dangerous and threaten my regime. So I might as well kill him now and clean up the loose ends that might bite me in the ass later. Like you know, in the past it has the Tsars. <laughs> but regardless, uh, uh, there was a dude who made a documentary on him. I was uh, supposed to have him on the stream to, to get a better insight uh, into Navalny's. How the fuck do you know Putin's bad? How the fuck do I know Vladimir Putin is bad? Well, one, I'm from a country that has our own Vladimir Putin. His name is Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Uh, and uh, across the board, not good. Okay. Not good at all. So that's number one. Oh, Number wow, two, great. Uh, I don't know. Think about all of the things that Vladimir Putin has done uh, in his rise to power. Okay. That you don't care about. You, you don't even care about to speak to anyone from our region. You don't even care. Like, forget about that. Forget about that. Forget about talking to any informed Ukrainian. You won't even talk about anyone who is informed about the subject, period. Uh, whether it be invading neighboring countries like Ukraine. Well, you didn't seem to be so much against it when it happened. You said it was Russia gaining back its territory. I'm not going to forget that. You said it loud and clear. <laughs> or... Uh, aligning himself with uh, or, or, or engaging in brutal actions in its uh, in his uh, foreign policy in general. Oh, you mean genocidal action like in Ukraine again? Brutal action. 
You were sent videos of executions today by people from Ukraine who begged you to talk to them because of your, the nonsense that you're spewing. I saw it. He's done some cool shit like ride horses shirtless. That much is true. Ha ha ha. Very funny joke. As Ukrainian cities are being erased from the map. Quite literally. Very funny shirtless Putin joke. I cannot contain my laughter. Or uh, how based. You know, bring forward uh, phenomenal American talent like Steven Seagal to make them ambassadors. Forgive me for not seeing the humor, especially today. Okay, but overall, yeah, Chechnya. Um, <laughs> a a. Uh, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot. A lot of assassinations. Uh, it so does, much. doesn't it? So much good stuff overall, but uh, <laughs> some actually good stuff like Steven Seagal. So who's to say if he's really a bad guy at all? He did not support it, but he was okay with it, which to me is basically a distinction without a difference. Saying that Russia is simply gaining back its territories, to me, it's basically supporting it. Sorry, not sorry. Um, saying that giving a voice to Ukrainians is psychotic great great as always wonderful let's continue let's hear what uh, he had to say about Marie, Navalny though both not surprised and outraged by the news reported death of Alexei Navalny he bravely stood up uh, yeah I love when people go do you, what do you think about Vladimir Putin? Um, what do you think about Vladimir Putin being... How do you know he's a bad guy? We're literally watching, like, his, his I guess, main opposite. Listen, today I'm focusing on his Ukrainian takes. I can focus on his one-piece takes next time. Today we're focusing, we're lasering on uh, Ukraine and possibly on Marxism. Position that is, like, outside of the... The, the, the sphere of, of Putin's influence, partially because he was uh, most likely backed by uh, American interests in general, that one guy who just died. So, okay. I wonder, I wonder how that happened. I mean, this Putin also, guy. Also, there's more than just one guy. There are still political prisoners that now that this has happened and had zero repercussions might happen to all of them. There are quite a few political prisoners who are against Putin in jail, in Waggers. Did you know that, Hassan Piker? And now, I guess they're just all going to be quietly executed since it's not a big deal. It's like just, Putin's just going to receive a wag of the finger because what else is going to happen? Not to even mention that all the other despots of the world are going to look at this and be like, oh, oh, wow, nice. So we can just sort of purge our opposition now and it's not really a big deal. Okay, that's that's pretty cool. Great. That's great. Because these sort of things have actually... Uh, you know, repercussions outside of Russia as well. We live in a pretty connected world and everybody's watching one another. It's not like in the Holodomor times when everything's isolated and you can invite a guest and put wool over their eyes and do a big incenization and pretend everything's fine. We find out about things much easier now than in the past. to the corruption the violence and the, the all the all the bad things that the Putin government was doing in response Putin had him poisoned he had him arrested he had him prosecuted for fabricated crimes he sentenced him to prison he was held in isolation even all that didn't stop him from calling out Putin's lies 
even in prison, he was a powerful voice for the truth, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. It was a mixed bag to say, to, to put it delicately, especially when it comes to Ukraine, which is a pretty significant topic. Should be to you, Joe Biden. But then again, he was opposed to Putin, I suppose. And he could have lived safely in exile after the assassination attempt on him in 2020, he did which nearly killed him, I might add. And, but he, uh, he was traveling outside the country at the time. Instead, he returned to Russia. He returned yeah, to Russia. Yeah, Big L, big mistake, by the way. Don't do that. Russia, knowing he'd likely be imprisoned or even killed if he continued his work. But he did it anyway because he believed so deeply in his country, in Russia. Which is, I will say, a mistake, especially since the, oh, it's a long story. Like the society is basically just very subverted to the government. And I already told, already said last stream why I think that is. I think it's an ironically a legacy of Joseph Stalin's big, big project of turning people into Soviet people which were subjugated to the state because the state had a grander purpose of moving history forward. And the state itself was personified by its leader, Joseph Stalin. And in this case, Putin. Who so people basically have drilled into their heads that what their, their individual wishes, their individual needs, for example, being able to comfortably buy groceries, means little in the grander scheme of things of the great Russia doing grand historical things on the world stage and moving history forward, quote unquote. And Putin being the figure that sort of personifies that grand purpose. I believe that Putin's taking a lot of cues from Stalin in that regard. Reports of his death, if they're true, and I have no reason to believe it or not, Russian authorities are going to tell their own story. But make no mistake, make no mistake, Putin is responsible for Navalny's death. Putin is I mean, this part is, uh, like, true on every front. Even if he died to natural causes, which, eh, very unlikely. I mean, technically speaking, like the... in Belarus, the person that should have won the election in Belarus also affected a lot of people. But in the end, we know how it ended. Like, we need more than just that. We need much more than just that. We would need a Russian Euromaidan. And we don't. We know that will. that's not happening. At least I don't think it's happening. Maybe I hope I'll be proven wrong. I just don't see it happening. Even though it, the timing of it is you suspicious don't. leading up to like an ele an election, right? Um, it, technically, he is at the response. People are just too numb in Russia to do uh, uh, Euromaidan. I think it's like they would need to be shaken much, much more. I don't even know what would it take for the sort of uh the russian society to wake up from its lethargic quite honestly state like a couple of hundred people were arrested i think 400 that tried to sort of put flowers etc when navalny died and they were arrested and that's basically it possibility of the state he's in prison if you die in prison the state fucked up no matter what Okay, so that part is 100% true regardless. ...is responsible. What has happened to Navalny is yet more proof of Putin's brutality. Yeah, while there's no, like, immediate motive, I guess, uh, uh, while there's no immediate motive, I do still believe that, you know, come on. No one should be fooled, not in Russia, not at home, not anywhere in the world. I mean, it doesn't matter if no one's fooled. What matters is what consequences will come from it. And so far, the answer is none. 
So it doesn't matter if anybody's fault. It doesn't matter if anybody believes or does not believe that Putin executed Navalny. It, it doesn't even matter, in my opinion. At least it doesn't matter to Putin. It might matter to the wider international public opinion, sure. But to Putin, it doesn't really matter. Putin does not only target his citizens of other countries, as we've seen what's going on in Ukraine. There's no motive in the sense that he's already in prison and he already had been like very publicly poisoned by Putin. You know, that is a stupid thing to say. Lenin was also at some point imprisoned and very much at the mercy of the Tsars. And we all know what happened when the Tsars let their enemy live, right? He came back and overthrew the Tsar. That was the logic behind it. I, or at least one possible logic behind it. It was one possible sort of, you know. You know what I mean? That's what I mean. So just because you have someone in prison, it doesn't mean, for uh, first of all, that they will be in prison forever. They can escape for one. A lot of different complicating factors can happen when you keep your enemy alive even in prison like stalin was exiled to siberia and he also he almost missed the revolution by the way by chance he got wind of it and escaped and took part in it like when you keep your enemy alive, imprisoned, it doesn't guarantee that they are no longer a threat, as history has demonstrated time and time again. So yeah, there is motive, even if Navalny was imprisoned in a wagger somewhere in a isolated land. There's obviously a motive, like a broader motive, but it's more like... Um... There's yeah. there's already like a like the obvious motive, right? What's the yeah? What's the? It just, I think it's it's more so like uh, I guess it brings up uh, additional political complications for him. I don't really know. A m brilliant analysis, brilliant analysis from the huge leftist streamer Hassan. I, I guess it brings him some political complications. I, I don't really know. I. I don't really know what I'm talking about. <sighs> yeah, I guess an entropy fan. Do you, Navalny could have very well been a plan B for the oligarchs should Putin prove to be a liability. Because basically, if we really analyze Navalny's sort of line... He also had a lot of imperialistic tendencies, so he would fit right in should he be given a chance to shine. Uh, I, I don't really know if that is that translates to like like the the word like the dangerous thing about Navalny is that maybe he would have fixed some of the corruption, which would have made Russia more I don't know effective, which would have been pretty bad, actually. <laughs> Ironically enough, fixing the corruption within an imperialist Russia would have actually been pretty dangerous for the world. Because w it's not just corruption that needs fixing in Russia. Russia's biggest problem is not corruption. Corruption is actually the thing that has made Russia, thank God, do many, many mishaps in the war, like trading fuel for things or doing many, many other stuff that had pretty big results, especially early in the invasion when tanks ran out of fuel. Do we remember that still? These memes? 
Do we remember these still? Vehicles running out of fuel and even some Russian soldiers asking the locals for fuel? Do we remember, do we remember that? I remember. It was a disaster. And it was caused by soldiers stealing fuel. Corruption. Like real issues domestically at all? Anyway, let's continue. Right now, he also inflicts terrible crimes on his own people. And his people across Russia and around the world are mourning the volunteers. Keep that same energy for Epstein. I and of course, the big disconnect that Vladimir Putin is just convinced, at least officially, that Russia uses state-of-the-art equipment and soldiers on the ground complaining that it's low-quality equipment that breaks down, that is garbage. And that also is a result of corruption, cutting corners, taking away some money, pocketing money. A lot of it is corruption. He could be. Like, we don't, we actually don't know what Navalny would have done if he would be actually in power. That is absolutely correct. We we cannot know that. And we will never know that because he is dead. I think you're 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 lost here if you don't think that I have the exact same energy for Epstein. Like almost identical. Unless you're talking about just like Joe Biden saying these things because there's gonna yeah. be a guest joining. Like this is just a speech, but I don't want to miss anything. I don't want to miss anything. And unlike... Oh my god, a bottle fell. Don't worry, I'm going to cut that out. Unlike Russia, Ukraine is actually doing something about its corruption. Because for one, it's a pretty big, like, it's a pretty big, huge... Uh, thing you need to do before joining the European Union. It's a big condition. Okay, it's a pretty big condition. Poland had to do away with a lot of its corruption. Like People don't remember this, but Poland and Ukraine, after the fall of the Soviet Union, were not all that far apart from one another in stuff like corruption, in stuff like poverty. They were not that far apart. And then sort of... Uh, the joining of the European Union happened. Like, I'm giving you a very simplified, of course, version of events, but Poland has gained a lot from joining the European Union. It is often forgotten because Poland is just looked at how it is today and nobody really remembers or nobody rather knows how it used to be. It used to be a Wild West where everybody could do whatever they wanted. I want, I want to build this here. No permit needed. Whatever. I do whatever. And it has... It has, like, benefited a lot. And Ukraine has looked at Poland. That, that was one of the factors why Ukraine actually felt favorable towards joining the European Union because they, uh, they they looked at Poland and saw, hey, this country right next to us used to be a lot more like us. And look at us now. Look at the difference. We could do the same. We could join the European Union and also sort of, you know... Like, I remember... In like the pretty early 2000s, thinking to myself, wow, uh, so my friend who is Ukrainian, like my friend who is Ukrainian wants to buy an apartment in Ukraine, I think for her son or something. And Ukrainian apartments are really cheap now. And sooner or later... I thought to myself, Ukraine is going to join. Uh, Ukraine is going to join European Union, etc. And then, 
the whole thing is going to go up, which means that the apartment prices are going to be up. So if I buy an apartment now in Ukraine, it's going to be a huge investment. But... Uh, things have not worked out quite like that. Versus if you sue some key word that triggers that high. Yeah, but they really don't want another Hungary or Poland. English people will be asking to go work in Poland a few years, probably the irony. Poland is in better shape, has problems of better shape than Hungary. Yeah, but because Hungary is a specific case because Hungary did what the Law and Justice Party tried to do now and succeeded, right? Keep in mind, the Law and Justice Party said, we want to, we want to make Warsaw the new Budapest. In no uncertain terms, the Law and Justice Party said, we want to emulate Hungary in what it did with its governance. And thank God it failed. Thank God it failed. Now, Orban needs to fail because of the whole scandal that is happening now. I actually saw, I actually saw newest news that apparently Hungary will not block the 13th um, sanction package. And I really wonder if it has anything to do with the instability within Hungary right now because of the scandal. Yeah, he is a talented politician. We we do need to give him that. But, okay, we're, we're going to talk about Hungary some other time. Today we're focus, focusing on Ukraine. There is a lot to talk about Hungary, especially recently with the with the horrible pedophilia scandal, how it created big, big protests, how the regime was shaken a bit. I'm not sure what the situation is now, but it definitely did not leave the regime unhurt. So, yeah. No, not Ukrainian aid, a uh, sanction package for Russia, not Ukrainian aid. Uh, apparently, because if you, uh, Hungary said that they would block the sanction package number 13 for Russia, and now I read that Hungary will not block the sanctions towards Russia anymore. So I was wondering if it was related in any way to sort of this brittle state. Okay, let's continue. Let's just continue. Yes. Epstein was... Oh, you meant Biden. Okay. Because Jeffrey Epstein's death was also incredibly suspicious. Okay. Let's not make such and comparisons. And not only that, but also... Uh, Jeffrey Epstein's death was also incredibly suspicious, but it, he also died in federal prison under very suspicious circumstances. So, yes, I still maintain the position that he did not kill himself, but instead absolutely was assassinated by the federal government. Okay. And the same principle, uh, the same principle stands for Jeffrey Epstein. He is supposed to be cared for by the fucking state. OK, why okay? are we talking He's about supposed Epstein? to be cared for by the state? He died under Trump. Why? Yes, he died under Trump. Uh, and and Bill Barr is the uh, primary responsible party in this circumstance uh, as the head of the DOJ. And not only that, but also, uh, like, it, it is worthy of an investigation if there was uh, if there wasn't actual bipartisan uh, uh, support on things of that nature, in my opinion, considering that he is uh, was also most likely an asset for the State Department today because he was so many things that Putin was not. He was brave. He was principled. <laughs> he was dedicated to building a Russia where the rule of law existed. And the I mean, I will admit that Navalny is being praised a little bit too much in the West. I used to argue that U.S. Uh, is like Russia. It is not. It is not. Not even close. I know. That's why I'm saying this is totally unrelated. That's U.S. 
and Russia are totally two different worlds. Totally two different worlds. To try to compare Russia to the US, it just means you don't have a clue. You don't know what you're talking about at that point. You're lost. How many Crimeas has US annexed lately? Tucker Carlson can exist in the US and in Russia apparently as well. Where it applied to everybody. Navalny believed in that Russia, that Russia. What is this fish? He knew it was a cause worth fighting for. Mm-mm-mm. -mm. You're making a mistake, Moose Watcher. He wasn't, Navalny wasn't actually necessarily for democratization of Russia. He was for toppling the regime of Putin. But toppling the regime of Putin and saying that Putin is corrupt does not automatically mean that he was for democratization. I mean, he can be tolerated. What I mean is that Tucker Carlson can be tolerated within Russia. If that makes sense. He will be tolerated as a useful idiot guest. Right. That is what I meant. And obviously even dying for. This tragedy reminds us of the stakes of this moment. We have to provide the funding so Ukraine can keep defending itself. Like Lenin also said that he was pro-democratization pro of Russia when he went against the Tsars. And we all know how that ended. Just to sort of keep things in perspective. Against Putin's vicious onslaughts and war crimes. You know, there was a bipartisan Senate vote that passed... Like we should be careful in the evaluation of Navalny as much as we sort of... He's praised. We should be a bit careful about that, in my opinion. Oh, yeah, yeah, I 100% I agree. Tucker Carlson cannot emerge within Russia. He has no idea how media environment works. Yeah, I, I agree 100%, yeah. He can be a useful idiot, certainly. Overwhelmingly, in the United States Senate to fund Ukraine. Now, as I've said before, and I mean this in a literal sense, history is watching. History is watching the House of Representatives. The failure to support Ukraine at this critical moment will never be forgotten. It's going to go down in the pages of history. It really is. It's consequential. And the clock is ticking. And this has to happen. We have to help now. Two-week recess, you know, we by the way. what we're dealing with with Putin. Mike Johnson, All of us should reject you. the dangerous statements made by the previous president. I don't even know what's going to happen to the invited Russia at this point. to invade our NATO allies if they weren't paying up. He said if an ally did not pay their dues, he'd encourage Russia to, quote, do, do whatever, whatever the wants, hell they yeah. want. It wants. It's Russia. My controversial opinion on this, which, oh my God, I probably should not have a contra controversial opinion on this, is that the, the, like, it wasn't, uh, mo I mean, I'll wait for obviously an investigation, even though like, come on, it's not going to be a real one. We'll probably never know. Right. It's, mm -hmm. it's almost impossible to get fucking real information on things such as this, regardless, regardless of wait, what on second. I gotta, I gotta bring in, I'm going to bring in my guest in a second. Oh my God. The guest, uh, do, 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 do. Actually, you know what? Let me do that real quick. Cause, uh, we have a Ukraine expert. Uh, that I will have. Ukraine expert who lived as a teacher for a few years in the country, long before the war, I might add. That sort of expert. Was it between 2017 and 18? Great. Ukraine expert. Coming on, because uh, we're going to be talking about like Ukraine updates as well. Gonna be coming in in it? person what or your online. Discord. Let's see. 
also a Marxist, as I've heard. So we're going. We have Marxist materials here prepared to give a little bit of. Is that context. Jeff Wittig, star the Bachelor? Uh, no. The the H three H three Bachelor? No. We were talking about how Navalny said Muslim migrants are cockroaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm not a, a, a fan of the guy either. Okay. I'm not a fan of either of these uh, people. No step oh, on no. snake. Uh, Bring in the guest. Hurry up, please. Okay. Okay, send your request. Okay. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Boom. Okay, I'm going to give a call to <gasps> Carl Bayer uh. right now, and we'll continue talking about this in a, uh, with him uh, on board. Hello. Hey, can you hear me? You there? Oh, oh my God, the audio is really bad. Holy shit! Hello. Uh, fix your audio, please. Um, do you do you? Okay, I would look at your, your sources audio, real expert. quick on your user settings, and look at uh, yeah. click on voice and video because it's like crazy no, bad. No, uh, Marxist. Shit. All right, give me a sec. Yeah, look at your your input device. And no, that's a real Marxist real marxist audio now we really know we're dealing with a marxist no prep whatsoever lovely and and, and cycle through them echo as well hear myself as well so i think you might have like the stream open or something yeah that I... are you ready to do this I've okay. got so and cool things for you. It, it's like it, it's like incredibly. Pa it just sounds robotic. I'm ready. It's patchy. There, it sounds like there's like a. It sounds like Marxist. An issue. It's like distorted. It's everything. It's I don't Marxist. know how else to describe it. Marxist audio. Yeah, sure. I've described it. Wait, it, it might be getting better. Yeah, Wait. I, is the same better? No, uh, it's a little bit it's, better, but no, it's, it's like not. still super blown it's out. Basically what kind of microphone same. are you using? Is it a headset mic? I I have a Yeti um, here. I don't think the hardware is the problem. I think I may just have poor reception out here. I don't have a broadband where I live, <laughs> so. Uh, no, it's definitely not the reception. It's I think it's the hardware. Uh, do you mind uh, flipping it off of like the Yeti to something else? Do you have anything else? Like your gain yeah, is really that. high. I think that your microphone gain is really high. I would lower that. I would uh, on the Yeti. There's a knob. I would. Uh, Maybe play around with that a little bit and lower it. And worst case, uh, we can just do it over the phone because I think like a phone could probably, a phone would most likely be better. But a I mean, phone. just play around with the knob a little bit and then. This is the mic from 1944. And, and, Sounds and, and like speak it. And I can, let me see and tell you if it's. Because your audio quality is like not, not good. great. Hello, hello, Carl. Carl Marx. Okay, you're deaf and now, so you can't hear me. <sighs> hello. Analog modem. Oh, come on. Stop wasting our time. Um, anyway, uh, while we're waiting on that, I'll give you guys a little bit of a background on Carl and also give you a little... A teacher in Ukraine for two years. That's the background. And has many friends. And is a Marxist. There you go. I've saved you a speech. That's the background. A little bit of a background on the top of the hour ad break, which is coming right now. If you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe. I'm for five dollars or for free, here's the three minute break now. No, no, never. Okay. I'm not doing That's that. That's number one. Uh number two, 
Carl Bayer is a, a Jacobin Mag writer. Okay. Uh -huh. He lived in Ukraine for a couple years. And Long before the war. But go on. And by war, I mean the full scale invasion. Just so we're clear. And uh, I would say that he has a uh, he works for the People's Policy Project, uh, the think tank, a crowdfunded think tank. Amazing. And uh, writes for uh, Jacobin Magazine. Amazing. Great. And I think that he has a very interesting take on Ukraine in general as someone who's uh, lived there. And I've been meaning to have him on to, to discuss uh, for a minute now. Can you hear me, Carl? You know who you could have? on who have lived like in ukraine for some time ukrainians they've lived in ukraine for quite a bit for a few years at least i would say you could have them on and you could listen to their perspective what a novelty you could you know interview the natives It's it, Discord reads like you're speaking. You have a green circle around you, but I can't hear you at all. So maybe you oh lowered God. the gain a little too much, potentially. That would have been too much, wouldn't it? An overload of coolness. I don't know. I, I can't hear you at all now. If you actually have Ukrainian people on. Hello? Oh, I hear you breathing. I mean, they tell him that he's full of crap, so maybe that's a little bit too much of a risk. I think I just heard I you know. breathe. Hello, hello. Testing, testing one, two, three. Oh, testing okay. This one, is a little bit better. Two, three, but still not ideal. Still a bit Marxist. Can you hear me now? Even I've got definitely. better audio. And I'm not a prestigious Marxist writer who lived in Ukraine. Document subscriber here. They do fantastic work. Says paleontologizing. That's a sick name. Paleo salute. Paleontologizing. I'm a. Well, I assumed that you were. Prison Sunday follows him on I, Twitter. I, no, I I got I got I dig dinosaurs. I assumed that you're. You do that. <laughs> that would be, it would be an odd name to have if you didn't do that. <laughs> um, that's sick. That's cool as hell. I love uh, Twitch channels that have like uh, unique interests like that. Okay. Or unique work like that. Oh yeah, I have to um, go to a place tomorrow. Mm. Stop hiding Godzilla. Oh shit! Don't get the Godzilla truthers started in here, dude. Uh oh. oh. The worst thing about this is that I'm actually going to have to cut out all of this crap when I edit the video to be a segment. I'm not going to keep this in. Chris Pratt is mid and homophobic and I'm tired of pretending like he's not. That's cool. I don't know where that came from, but okay. And then why I you read just it? log on the phone and call in that way in my opinion. Oh. Probably the best and fastest mercy. way to do this. Okay, while Have he's working on that, on I'm going to. Uh... Hello, I Carl. I came here you hear for me? context, not for this. Yeah, can you hear me right now? Oh, dude, perfect. It you worked. There? You fixed it. You fixed it completely. Wonderful. Let's go. <laughs> right before I. Yeah, right before I came on, there's a driver download that just totally messed up my headphones and my headphone mic and everything. And so okay, I think good, that's what good. Happened. Can we get to the point? Okay, now? we don't need. Carl, excuses. can you give us? A, well, you know, it happens. I, uh, I, we're all tech boomers out here. Um, <laughs> Some of us are certainly. So obviously, a lot has occurred uh, in the time yeah. frame where I asked you to come on, uh, especially for like Russian politics, I guess. Uh, which we can uh, touch politics. on as well as yeah. uh, we were just watching Joe Brandon talk about how a bunch of Westerners discussing Russian politics. You're never gonna get a you know people from the region, are you? 
Because they don't know any better. Of course they don't know any better. Why would you have them on when you can have a proxy like this guy? Alexei Navalny's death is a result of Putin and his thugs, he said. Uh, taking a strong stance against Vladimir yeah, Putin. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, yeah. and I don't know if you like... Uh, looked at all of the uh hassan uh ukraine takes that was uh swirling around as i as i asked you to like go through them a little bit maybe you didn't maybe you did i don't know we can go through yeah. them as well okay yeah um, okay uh, let's let's see as one of the takes the whole having ukrainian voices on is psychopathic and perverted is that gonna be a take yeah, I looked through it a bit and looked at uh, some of the responses and that kind of thing. So I have a general idea, I think. Yeah. Okay, general um, idea. So you are, uh, do you mind uh, giving a little bit uh, of your background to those background. Uh, in the in the audience that might not be familiar with your work? Because I feel like um, while you are also a, a, a dirty little lefty, um, I feel like your opinion on Ukraine yeah. is, is shaped by your experience with Ukraine. Um, you you lived there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you lived yeah I lived. I lived. I lived there between uh, 2017 and about 2018. Uh, so I was correct. Um, and I was just teaching there. I went out there to teach English. I've also lived in Russia. I uh, lived in Moscow for a little bit. Um, and besides that, you know, I have some academic background uh, in Russia. I'm a member of the Association for Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies. Okay. Um, this is, I, I would say, this is kind of like my geopolitical field or as close as it comes. Okay. Um, there you go. Some powerful credentials. Let's see if they will translate into some powerful words. Hassan really is a U.S. Western chauvinist. Just can't comprehend it. But yeah, I've I've uh, I've I've been to both. Again, why not get people from Ukraine on? There are many educated experts in Ukraine right now that could come on and speak on the issues. Why not do it? Countries and then sort of all over Ukraine, traveled all over the place, and I feel like I have a pretty... We've lived in Ukraine a bit longer than for two years as teachers of English. No offense. Pretty good handle on what's going on there. Okay, perfect. Um, on that note, I think that there was... Um, I feel uh, like in the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, mm -hmm. there were yeah. a lot of people who took L's, myself included, in terms of like... Um, reading the situation and thinking that mm -hmm. uh, I, I had this like a famous tweet that everybody keeps always bringing up where I uh, said uh, that Putin is a, is a bad person and not a mad person and yeah. that he would never Indeed. be able to permanently annex a country with 44 million people that has a national project of like being not a part of Russia, which is all be it reductive terms. But I think that uh, I still stand by the second part of that. But uh, yeah. this was the reason why I was uh, very uh, uh, callous in my analysis yeah. alongside many of our friends, our mutuals, like the Chapo boys as well, saying that Russia will never invade Ukraine. You guys are fucking going crazy over that kind of thing. And yeah. um, you had, a, I, I guess you had a slight difference in perspective um, yeah. at that at that time, maybe get, uh, considering your, your background and... And uh, I wanted to, I wanted to hear, like, I wanted to get started on that part. Yeah, like, I wanted to get go yeah. all the way back to, I guess, square four. Wouldn't yeah, say it's square yeah. one, but yeah. So I mean, I on think a paper. lot of this relitigation of um, the invasion and who got it right and who got it wrong was silly because, you know, the fact is the people who got it right, it's not like they had some kind of access to intelligence of that's technically speaking correct but that is not why people were mad with hassan it's not that he got it wrong that the invasion would not or would happen no it's that he got the thing wrong and then he, he just continued going down horrible horrible takes 
The invasion won't happen. Oh, it happened. But you know what? Russia is just taking its own territory. That sort of thing. That sort of takes. Or the Euromaidan takes. I, I'm pretty sure Hassan also had some baffling takes about the Euromaidan itself. Like this sort of thing. Horrible take. Proven wrong. Into the next horrible take. Into the next horrible take. Horrible take after horrible take. Also, we sort of did have access to intelligence because the intelligence has warned that the invasion would happen. Yes, that, yes, that is actually true. And we, so we did see the MS troops. We did see uh, blood bags being, yes, we actually did have all these things. So what was actually going on at the battlefront or anything like that. They just believed uh, people who... I mean, that is true. That was... Like, everybody spoke about that as it was happening. You are correct here. Yeah. We didn't believe, or who um, a lot of folks You're on correct. the left didn't believe. Yeah, so like the State Department. It, yeah, and and it's... So it's silly to kind of, you know, say, well, I guessed it's right, not, and yeah. sort of it's position not, yourself as yeah. having credibility besides that. And I also think that people were very justifiably uh, skeptical of Agree to um, disagree, move what on. was going on. You know, the fact is that, yeah, Putin had troops at the border, but they've had troops at the border for, you know, since 2014. Um, this has been an ongoing situation, and for most of the time, Putin had not invaded. Um, so there was an I... ongoing war since 2014, at least from our perspective, the Eastern Europeans. I thought that it's always possible that it's going to flare up mm. again. You know, I was out in Kharkiv and I could hear gunshots when I was there. And this was all the way back in like 2018. Um, so, you know, it's it's not like this battle it has just now started. It's This war has been going on for a long time. But I guess the reason that I got it right was probably just... Just knowing that there's, it, it, it was entirely possible, you know, they're already in Donetsk, uh, they're already in Crimea, there's no real reason uh, for him not to, and Putin's game, it, like, he's done the same thing in Georgia. Where exactly. The war has been raging since 2014. That has been the consensus, like, in the countries near Ukraine that the war has been just happening since 2014. Where he sort of tests the boundaries sometimes of what the rest of the world will allow. Um, and historically, he's only sort of gone like an inch at a time forward and then moved back. So I was expecting... I'm not sure if taking Crimea is an inch, but, you know, what, whatever you... Whatever is clever something more like that um nobody i know was actually expecting a assault on kiev that that is still shocking to me yeah. um and i think that i think that people who say that they do did expect it are really underappreciated i honestly i mean that was many years ago but a lot of people in poland were actually scared in 2014 that Putin would just, you know, that Russia would just move forward and not stop, that it would just move forward deeper into Ukraine and just actually do the whole full-scale invasion right there and then. That was a thing that a lot of Polish people feared in 2014. Like, there was a lot of super fear about the war in 2014 that will not just stop where it did, that it sort of like freeze where it did, that Russia would just push forward and forward and forward and then passed. That was a big fear, as I recall. People were not as cool and chill about 2014 as people in Poland as they were in the U.S., 
devastating. What a crazy move that was. Yeah. Um, you know, this is this is an assault on one of the oldest capitals of Europe. Uh, I'm I'm convinced that if it had kept up and if it looked like there was any serious question of Kiev toppling, I don't know that one of the oldest. I mean, OK, if only it meant anything and. It only it meant anything, actually. That the U.S. would have gotten involved. But I think it's entirely possible that you would have seen a much stronger response coming out of Europe. Just because that's a, that's a nuts thing to happen. Um, yeah. And it's such a gamble. Like, it's such a gamble for Putin to do that. It didn't make sense to me. Do you, um, Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my my assessment is uh, even now that uh, I think Putin uh, underestimated uh, the the anti air uh, defenses that uh, Ukraine would have, yeah, uh, and yeah. that and that that greatly limited its like uh, potential air superiority, yeah. and I, I and I think that that was like a major. I think that that was a a major issue in like not being able to conduct this in air quotes, special military operation in the yeah. ways that they thought they could. And, the was not and now they're in the, this like a uh, weird from day one. Um, yeah. in Eastern Ukraine. I think, I think that's pretty accurate. Um, it, uh, it, as I understand it, Putin got some pretty bad intelligence uh, before coming into Ukraine. And that was the big part of it. Right. Uh, yeah. I think he did People are yes, underestimate out just the amount of resistance he would meet. I think he also uh, er, underestimated how quickly it would come I know, and I how quickly out. Ukraine would sort of get its defense together and be able to put a strong one. Because if I had to guess, I would say that Putin probably was sort of rolling the dice on Kiev, hoping maybe he could get like a quick knockout, um, kind of cut the snake off at the head type strike. He was hoping for the government to be weak and fragmented and for the people to be more pro-Russian. Many soldiers actually expected to be greeted with flowers, unironically. Expected Ukraine not to put up a fight as it did. So certainly Russia did underestimate Ukraine in that regard to its detriment. Uh, and if, you know, if he could have done that, it, was, it would have been a large victory, but he plainly was not prepared for any kind of siege or anything like that. And that's one of the reasons why he retreated eventually. Uh, the Russian army retreated rather. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that you've got that about right. Yeah, and um, and then that retreat happened, and then in the process, there was also uh, obviously the the uh, ceasefire talks that occurred. There, there was a fifteen point plan uh, yeah. that was uh, set forward in uh, in, I in Turkey. I cannot believe that this is going to be entertained. Of course, this is going to be entertained that I thought was like pretty solid overall for all things considered and how much worse it could have gotten you would, um, yeah, and relatively you. early on as well. And my assessment here was that, um, well, one, I guess like I always uh, said that Crimea was different in comparison mm -hmm. to like the 2022 invasion. Uh, it was both different in terms of like military opposition. It was different because of the, the population uh, size and their uh their their uh oh, like no. prior russification initiatives that already made it so that like uh crimea was uh, was predominantly occupied by uh people who uh oh so russification worked well in crimea well guess crimea is just lost then i guess the standard is if russia can get in and enact Russification that works, then I guess those territories are just forfeit, aren't they? What sort of logic is that? Excuse me? This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I already said before, Russification almost succeeded in the Congress Kingdom of Poland. 
So what? Poland would be forfeit if it worked completely? I just cannot believe what I'm hearing. Yeah, of course. Like, what Hassan is trying to say here is that Crimea is different not because it had troops, Russian troops, but, it be, but because it was so Russified that it's basically Russian. That is what he is saying. The Russification has worked so well in Crimea that it's basically just Russian now, so it's different. So it maybe just should be Russian at this point since since the Russification has been so successful and great in Crimea. We salute to Thomas. Apparently might makes right. Apparently. Uh, had, I guess, a, a connection to Russia. You had Sevastopol yeah. and... Uh, like the the annexation and the way that it was conducted was very different uh, than than what is happening right now in eastern Ukraine. Also, right? I don't know. Again, Karasu has pointed out correctly. Why is he only talking about Crimea? Like the, 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 it was more than just that. Yeah. But it really gets to me this argument of the Russification was so successful that basically uh, you know it's just russian now right um uh, obviously lpr and dpr were were uh, accompanied with that or the interference in lpr and dpr were was was accompanied with the 2014 uh actions right yeah um yeah. and that was an ongoing conflict back and forth uh, uh bombing <sighs> campaigns uh and then of course like russian backed uh uh, military uh, routinely fighting and yeah there's just a big standoff going on especially yeah. in donetsk forever yeah uh, and you could actually as of 2018 you could actually still go there uh it wasn't particularly safe the Good city is basically divided in two and there was kind of a line between that you could um there's kind of a safe zone where people who lived on one side could move to the other and vice versa and it kind of fluctuated between a frozen conflict and a hot conflict um it was just like that way for years on end yeah um and i personally think that here's, here's a couple things like okay. people who uh, push z right yeah. Yeah. They claim that um that that one Russia and Ukraine are one nation mm -hmm. uh and that they're all uh you know they're all the same people uh yeah. which is of course channeling like uh I guess it's channeling historical illiteracy that is what I will say it is a powerful channeling of historical illiteracy it's both Dugan and Putin mm -hmm. in some ways it's a hyper nationalistic yeah. sentiment um, they also claim that uh, there was obviously a lot of Nazis there and the denazification component was significant, which... Yeah, and then Russia also said that Poland should be next for denazification. In fact, I recall... Uh, I recall distinctly Russia saying at the beginning of 2023 that, in fact, the entirety of the West has is full of nazis and should also be swiftly denazified so the whole not nazi argument is so empty so devoid of any value that i don't i don't even think it should be brought up at this point ridiculous i thought it was always a bullshit justification obviously um not yeah. to say that there aren't uh but yeah. that is not a, a, mm -hmm. a real reason especially considering that when you do invade a country, mm -hmm. those yeah. nationalists are going to be hailed as heroes and will be able to, uh, in the aftermath of the invasion, no matter which way it goes, they will always be a, a, a more, there will be people, that, that, that sentiment of nationalism will be mm -hmm. galvanized because they will be seen as uh, emancipators, right? Oh, yeah. Because they're the most well, militant factions. Yeah, there's, I mean, yeah, there's that. There's just, whenever you have a war, it 
really stirs up nationalism and nationalistic resentments mm. against the enemy. Um, and, you know, you have like I'm I'm watching people who I consider friends uh, from Ukraine and who I would also consider to be sort of perfectly ordinary European liberals okay. uh, before the invasion. And now, you know, I listen to them talk about Russians and, you know, yeah. they'll use the word trolls or orcs, orcs. or yeah. whatever. What do you and expect you just have to, you know, I, I I'm not going to be too hard on somebody who's bunkered down in their basement during bombs uh for getting a little mad at the people uh a little bombs. mad but it, you know the, it is happening there's a genocide going on teacher sir there's a literal genocide going on you know kidnapping of children transferring children from one group to the next Mass executions of adults and children. Mass rape. Come on, teacher. You really gonna get mad about the orcs at a time like this? Is, is this really happening? Do pretty much say they're one nation. They they do say that. And it, it, I think that that's one of the most ridiculous things about Putin's denazification rhetoric is this war is only going to intensify nationalistic sentiment yeah. in the country. It's definitely putting the political uh, hard right. Oh yeah, that's in, the biggest... uh, Ukraine in a better position than it was beforehand. Um, it's not even a big power in Ukraine right now. What do you mean? It's, I mean, Zelensky himself is... Oh, yeah, it's such would, a far-right nationalist. They in danger. He can't... He, he's, he, he's in a very bad position where if he bargains, he's going to be seen as selling his country out uh, by yeah. a lot of Ukrainians and by the hard right. I mean... And that's how they're going to sell it. Really? We're going to focus this talk on the far... On the hard right... Really? Is this really happening? Um, and, you know, if if I were him negotiating, I would want to do it outside of Ukraine and I would stay out of Ukraine afterwards. He He's not going to want to go back. Yeah. Um, um, but... It just just a word about the um, the sort of Russian populations in Crimea and Donetsk and so on. Um, it is it is true that this person has a very specific way of pronouncing the names. I will say that much. Ukraine, what you know, Kiev was historically the capital of Russia, um, and I'm, what there is. This Wait, hold on, what? Ultra nationalism. It's true that Ukraine, what you know, Kiev was historically the capital of Russia. No, it's not true at all, teacher. What sort of bullshit are you trying to sell us? It, it is absolutely not true. Kiev has never been historically the capital of Russia. It has been the capital of Kiev, Rush, which is a totally different thing from. No. Absolutely not. Um, and there is this ultra nationalism in Putin sort of oh, claiming God. them all for his, but it's nationalistic both ways. You know, it, it, none of these, like, I guess I sort of take the old left uh, socialist position that the nation state is always kind of this artificial reactionary institution and we need to get rid of it. And I look at, I look- Kiev Rush was not a nation state. You should know that as a teacher. 
So what are we even talking about? What are we even conflating here? I cannot believe this. Look at this conflict through that lens because so much of it is about people defending borders and people sort of defining, okay, well, am I am I ethnically Russian, whatever that means, or ethnically Ukrainian? You know, um, even even the language controversies are a little silly because you silly. What what sort of ridiculous thing am I gonna like here now? Ukrainian is already very very close to Russian, and depending on where you live, Ukrainian comes from Ruthenian, a separate language to uh, Russian. Ukrainian is closer to Polish than to Russian. Also great stance, get rid of nation state, but for an empire? It's even closer. Um, so we're we're talking about slight changes in vocabulary and spelling here, not even a massive change in the language. That's bullshit. That is such bullshit that I cannot believe it. When Russian soldiers came in and heard Ukrainian, in many cases, they said that it was Polish, that it wasn't Ukrainian. Because soldiers expected to just understand it right off the bat. And they didn't. And then they said it's not actually Ukrainian. What those people are speaking is Polish. That actually happened. Yes, Ukrainian and Russian are similar. But then you could make a very... You could make a case that Russian... Like that Ukrainian and Polish are closer. They have 70%... Uh, shared vocabulary, which is a lot more than Russian and Ukrainian, by the way. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with you at all. Um, I, I would say the same about, I mean, it's, it's even closer uh, from where I'm standing between like the similarities between Armenians and Turks or Greeks and Turks, uh, yeah. especially because like at least Armenians and Greeks are, you know they're they're christian whereas yeah. like the turkish nation is supposed is predominantly muslim um yeah. but overall like yeah the people look the same true uh there's obviously a even if the language wasn't meaningfully different it wouldn't have mattered anyways i mean you have austria and germany two separate countries even though they both speak german the exact same language so this whole argument is just worthless to the garbage with it Unless you say that Austria should belong to Germany or vice versa, you're in favor of a little bit of an Anschluss. Different language there too, but like the people look the fucking same, the food is the same, the architecture mm -hmm. is the same, the culture is pretty... No, it's... Oh. <sighs> then all Slavic countries are basically Russia by that logic. Let's go there. Poland is Russia. Lithuania is Russia. Estonia, everything. Well, technically speaking, Lithuanians are not even Slavs, but that's a whole different topic. Lithuanians are not actually Slavs. If, as if you actually were curious about that. And actually Slavic people. Pretty much the same. And yet there's like thousands of years of, of conflict. Interesting, um, you know. And in, in the situation with Ukraine and, and Russia... Um, yeah. there's the, the similarities are way more prominent than the differences. And yet, obviously, no matter what happens, of course, there's going to be nationalistic sentiment because the people have decided that, you know, this is their country. And I yeah. think that they have a right to, you know, obviously want to diff. Of course, the architecture system is not going to argument here as you see very distinct architecture heritage within Ukraine. Of, of course, because it was for the longest time separate from Moscovites and their homes from being fucking bombed. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Absolutely. So um the the reason why I brought up the pushing Z conspiracists uh is is specifically because of like how off base I I think they are with respect to like 
how the invasion has gone thus far and what the outcomes have been for Russia, right? Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Because, like, I, I think it's just copium to to uh, look at the situation and be like, no, this has been a phenomenal achievement. Like, Ukraine was never... Ukraine will never join NATO now. I am a, a, a firm believer that the Western forces sold Ukraine down the line because they never genuinely were going to ever... Uh, I don't believe that they were ever going to let Ukraine into NATO. Um, yeah, yeah. And that, that was just simply a, a thing that they dangled in front of mm. uh, Ukraine. Um, oh, yeah. And, and, Absolutely. and I mean, a similar opinion that I have, and I wanted to hear your take on this, I think it exists within, like, uh, the the Turkish... Uh, the Incredible. The, the peace plan or the ceasefire negotiations that took place in Turkey... The idea that, um, the idea that, like, uh, I think... Yeah, there was the... You had, of course, the partition times when different parts of Ukraine uh, found themselves in different partitions, and that also affected not just the architecture, but also the language. This is where the whole East-West language divide came from. Keep in mind. Zelensky this is where it originated maneuvered expertly in that situation where he said like we will do a referendum on crimea 15 years down the line which i think is like a a really smart way to neutralize that uh hot potato i guess yes um, hot, saying yeah, like potato. of course we're gonna have a referendum we're a democracy after all which like should be um i don't trust referendums about territory by the way historically speaking those referendums were just a pretext for countries to drive as many people as possible to take part in them. I don't think I've ever seen a referendum that just went smoothly without any sort of hijinks when it came to referendums that were just which country should we belong to? Should should at least like quiet down more reactionary uh, 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 parts of the country that would have uh, genuinely uh, attacked him with nationalistic sentiment about like every inch of land being brought back into Ukraine, uh, no matter how, uh, no matter what the cost of that would look like or whether it was even possible or not. I mean, it was, and I it's, think that it's um, it's internationally recognized borders. I I think that uh, that kind of fell apart, at least according to uh, uh, reports at the time with the additional confidence that was given to Zelensky and maybe internal pressure as well, but definitely additional confidence given to Zelensky by Boris Johnson visiting Ukraine. Am I overestimating Boris Johnson here and like uh, what that meant for what an or, or what that decision teacher. was as far as like Western forces? Oh, no, totally not. We're backing totally you the not. entire no, way. No. Uh, or or, yeah. or uh, do you think that that actually did play a role? Well, I think, yeah, I saw... Um, one guy complaining about your take on that. Um, and I, what I would respond to that is, you know, ultimately we really don't know uh, what he said or what kind of pressure he put. We can sit here and do a lot of speculation conjecture, and but, uh, but there's no way to know about that for sure. Uh, that said, that I said, think like but... the big thing that we're doing right now is, you know, we are dangling the prospect of military aid in front of them. And, you know, not not just what we're giving, but not dangling like the European Union is starting to pull off, like to pull its weight. Like, keep in mind, Europe is se like seriously now because of what the U.S. is doing, considering creating a European equivalent to NATO. That is a thing that's being discussed seriously right now. of potentially ramping it up. Um, and when you actually think about the degree of intervention that it would take to root Russians out of their positions where they're already entrenched uh, to do stuff. Yeah, that's... Oh my God, I hate this so much. This, oh... That's because the aid was handled horribly from the very beginning. Trickling little bit by bit that's why 
to get them out of Crimea, to uh, block off the borders. Uh, you know, you need to do a lot of air control and you need to do a lot of Black Sea control. Um, it, I mean, Black Sea is not doing very well now for Russia, is it? How many ships has Russia lost to a country without its own fleet now? And Russia cannot even bring in new ships. So what are we even talking about when it comes to the Black Sea? It's just utterly implausible that we are ever going to make that kind of commitment. But that is... And somehow Ukraine has regained 50% of the gains from the beginning of the invasion using a fraction of what the U.S. has spent on different conflicts. Like, what are we talking about here? And again, the aid was dripped, 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 dripped. This is ridiculous. Is more or less how Ukraine is often defining victory now is, you know, not giving up an inch of soil and Russia just kicked out completely. So there's something not connecting here. And I yeah, think that, and that thing is the GOP. That, um, I actually tweeted this out yesterday. I think that hawks who want intervention even if you want intervention, you have to start being honest about the fact that the U.S. just is not going to make that level of commitment. I mean, it's not willing to give aid. because I mean, the U.S. itself is actually willing to commit to aid. It's the grand old party that is not willing to commit to aid. We have to make this very important distinction. Mike Johnson and Donald Trump, specifically speaking, because a lot of Republicans are actually apparently pro aid as well. Yeah, it's not on, it's not on the table like we would. I, I think that realistically, we would have to have NATO troops on the ground because th their big deficit right now is just manpower. Yeah, um, that that's not true. Their big deficit is not just manpower. That can be. There is a lot of talking about the draft, but there is a critical shell shortage. There is a critical equipment shortage. There is a critical ammunition shortage. The biggest problem is not the lack of manpower. The biggest problem is the lack of the means to defend the weapons, the ammunition. Are you serious? Are you, are you really saying that Ukraine has enough weapons, but it just, it just doesn't have enough men to use them? That's the that's the major problem. I no, it's not. It actually isn't. A draft can be done. They're working on a draft, but the bigger, the, by far, the bigger problem is the lack of what the critical lack of weapons. Anti-air missiles, shells. Have you not been paying attention? I thought you had many friends. I thought you were. An expert. I thought you were in touch. I think it, at this point uh, yeah. is not even necessarily like um, uh, a, a uh, the amount of weapons. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me right now? Avdivka wasn't lost because there were not enough men in Avdivka. Avdivka was lost because there was not enough weapons, etc. Munition. Anti-air. Give me a break. This is what I'm talking about. This is why people hate you on this topic. Because you say stupid thing after one, after the other. It's not some secret knowledge how much Ukraine is lacking in munition right now, how desperate it is for shells, etc. It's not some secret knowledge. You can just read any sort of publication on it from Ukraine or any other place. Incredible. It's just, I don't, I don't know what to say. Or munitions, which certainly is an issue still, obviously. Um, it is a critical issue. The word critical is used over and over and over for a reason. This cannot, 
you you cannot be so far detached out of the reality from of what's going on and still s try to place yourself as some sort of expert you you cannot be serious but the major uh, issue is that there's just not enough uh, people. That's not true. W where did you get that from? Like, there's enough weapons, but there just isn't enough people to man the weapons? Avdivka was lost because there were just weapons lying around and not enough people were in Avdivka to, to man the weapons? And all that ammo? To, yeah. To hold back. N no. It's the opposite, actually. Um, and so they're and so they're trying to solve this problem with conscription, which has... it is certainly a problem. But the bigger problem is the critical lack of munition, because it leads to people dying, which makes the problem of people bigger actually been going on for you know almost really since the beginning of the war um though it wasn't reported much but like at the very beginning when ukrainian men were trying to get out of the country uh you would often get caught at the trains at the border and turned back and i knew men who were just like hiding in kiev um i have another friend right now who has been living in a European country. I'm not going to say which one, because honestly, I don't want people trying to track them down. Um, what the f what? How would you able, to, how would you be able to track them just by the name of the, but I have a friend who's been living in a European country for a while. She has a kid. Uh, her kid has only seen her, uh, father for the first month of his life. And it's, approaching two years now um it, the husband is hiding in ukraine can't get out but doesn't want to fight this woman's brother is also hiding in ukraine uh doesn't want to fight and it's not oh anecdotes and i love anecdotes so much they're the biggest they're, they're, they're the best anecdotes are always sort of what you should make rules on i have anecdotes of my own Anecdotes are worthless in discussions like this. Like they side with the Russians or anything like that. They just don't want to die, um, which is completely understandable. But this is a problem that we are creating. This is so ridiculous. I can also say that I've met people, I have friends Ukrainian friends that said that they would just, if Russia was to take over, then they would be in favor of uh, Ukraine just becoming part of Poland. It doesn't mean anything. Individual anecdotes. It's worthless. It's useless to sort of create this. Oh, I've got a few friends that said this and therefore that's a big problem that's being created. No. It's a few anecdotes that you've given. It's worthless to sort of build a rule of some sort or even a problem of some sort to construct some theory about a problem on that basis. Come on, give me data, not anecdotes, if you want to tell me about that. Yes, there are people that are paying to get out of the... Uh, service. There are people like that. But there are also, for any person that doesn't want to fight, you'll find many people that will want to fight. So, again, anecdotes are useless. They're worthless. There's a reason why that is widely accepted as the case, that anecdotes are not useful things to analyze wider trends. I, 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 I was pretty sure that would be a given. That would be obvious for our fa like fellow Marxist. Reading directly, and you see like Americans online defending conscription of. And yes, 
Russia has forcefully conscripted people from the uh, occupied areas. That is definitely true, which is against the law. Also, there are options within Ukraine forces to do non-combatant services too. True. Like, there are many things. Like, there are also medics, etc. There's many things. Anecdotes are evidence. They just happen to be the worst kind of evidence. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if we should be going with the worst kind of evidence as our first option, is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Like, there are many things, there are many elements when it comes to the army. It's not just people fighting at the front, it's the back end as well. There, there are many elements when it comes to the army, definitely. You're definitely right about that. You're definitely correct here. The Ukrainians who don't want in this war, and it's just the most horrifying thing to me. Like, they don't want to go fight. Yeah, like, exactly. Well, the there are many who do. Like, come on. This is ridiculous, this sort of rhetoric. Like, you're, also, you're almost creating a picture of no Ukrainians actually wanting to fight. They're all hiding in Kiev, frightened. Like, come on. I can give anecdotes as well. There are people who were living in Poland when the invasion started. There's this famous anecdote of, of people in the bar drinking beer or whatever, seeing that the invasion started on the TV and just dropping everything and going to Ukraine to fight. I can drop, I can drop anecdotes all day as well about people that dropped living in Ukraine, in Poland and just went to Ukraine in order to defend their country. There's been several stories like this. The like, foreign legion it's like it's not you you don't have to be a you don't have to <laughs> yeah. like actively be a, a an active duty service member you can go and join i know people on this very platform that have done that um yeah i mean fucking what uh, robert f kennedy's son did it didn't he like i think yeah well, this has always been, it's funny because this has always been an anti-war line is, you know, calling people chicken hawks and saying, well, go ahead and join. And sort of the, the subtext there is nobody is going to join a war like this um, historically just because it was actually pretty hard. But the strange thing about this war is it's really unusually easy for American civilians to get involved. Like you yeah. don't have to have certain, you know, certain kinds of background. You don't, okay. you, you're just flying over to sort of the edge of Europe. So you're not like yeah, going you go to Poland, the you of Vietnam. Yeah. yeah. You, you can literally go to Poland. Poland mentioned again. Take a fucking yeah. train into Ukraine and join the foreign legion. Uh, yeah. And I welcome all of the people who are like, no, this war should continue. To go yeah. and do that thing, to, to go and do that and and fight. It, it's nobody a... says this war should. Con this is such dishonest language, quite frankly, coming from Hassan Piker here. Nobody says this war should continue. People are saying this war should be won by Ukraine, and that's a difference. Nobody's just saying this war should just continue because we all, I, okay, not all of us, but most of us know what the occupation of Ukrainian territories mean for its citizens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of volunteers from Poland went to do sort of like medics, soldiers, yeah, yeah. Like there's a medic that I follow on Twitter that gives basically everyday updates of what's happening saying that Russians are basically targeting uh, those places where you gather the wounded to take them to a place where they can be treated, like that Russians are specifically targeting those spots, targeting medics, and of course targeting ambulances. We all know that there is this famous exhibition right now of a damaged ambulance.
bizarre and shame on us cease for keeping this person as a member and using them to legitimize himself as a person with an academic background. Nationalist pseudo-linguistics, horrible historical revisionism, etc. do promote Russian propaganda, but maybe it's just par for the course for Western Slav understander wannabe academics. Yeah, I would agree. As unfortunate as it is, I would agree here. And there are Westerners that actually went to, like, Ukraine and sort of took the effort to understand it, actually understand it, you know, during the war, not years before the full-scale invasion. To me, it's basically... Where is the thing that I've got here? Well, they keep forgetting the name of that horrible journalist. Uh. Here we go. One moment. Dilhanti, no. Duranti. It's like basically you have. And this is a story as old as time. Okay? You have Gareth Jones, who actually went to Ukraine, tried to understand it. So horrible things that were happening during the Holodomor and try to report about it abroad. And then you had the infamous Pulitzer Award winning Walter Duranty that just spoke to some officials, figured everything was okay, and called uh, Gareth Jones a propagandist who was just trying to uh, spread panic and lies about the famine. Russians hungry but not starving. The infamous article written by Walter Duranty. And this, I guess we're seeing the echoes of this. Like people who just go, don't really sort of dive deep, don't really do the effort to sort of on the ground assert like see what's going on and those who actually do and unfortunately historically speaking those who do the shallow work for whatever godforsaken reason get more clout and recognition usually I'm not gonna name names the just cause for first and foremost I've been very yeah. clear on my position, even though obviously, like, I have a very sizable. Hassan Piker uh, who says he's doing journalism. I'm not gonna name any names. I think we all know who I'm referring to. This uh, community online, and there are definitely disagreements on that front. I do personally think that it is a just cause uh, that that uh, Ukraine uh, has every right to uh, defend itself. Oh, from yeah. an invasion but uh, yeah. is there a but coming there has to be a but coming from our favorite journalist top tier journalist hassan piker nation yeah i think i i think that you know if you if you're a ukrainian and you want to make that decision you of course have every right to do that I think that it's a very distinct question as to whether we should be sending weapons over there um, or what kind of aid we should be sending. Uh, the answer is simple. The one that would allow Ukrainians to win. And it is more than possible. Let's not kid ourselves. It is more than doable. Just because... At, my my assessment at this point is that continued U.S. involvement in this is going to cost more lives than it's going to save. No, actually, it's the opposite. 
the withdrawal of U.S. involvement is going to cost far more lives than actually continuing or even ramping up the aid. The aid should be ramped up and hurried up. It's the opposite, actually. You're living in the opposite world. Actually, withdrawing aid will cause more and more people to die because the Ukrainians have already shown the will to fight whether or not the aid comes. Have we forgotten about that? Not even mention how much death, torture, rape, the occupation will bring. Are we not taking that into account? Have we learned nothing from what's been going on so far? Nothing? Is this person a Marxist or a trolley problemat problematarian centrist? I, I guess a trolley problematarian centrist. Like, he just comes from his ivory tower above from the West and says, you Ukrainians actually don't know what's good for you. You're just wasting lives. You, you just, you don't value lives like I do. You should listen to me. You should listen to me. Which is very interesting from a supposedly anti-imperialist person. Me, the Westerner from the better countries, come to you to tell you, I am here to free you from your suffering. This is not worth it. We're withdrawing aid. What is this? Like, does the will of the Ukrainian people not matter at all? I mean, the, uh, the answer is obvious to people like Hassan and this other person. Of course not. It doesn't matter if the Ukrainian people actually want to fight or not. No, we declare that actually, no, you'll just lose more lives than it's worth it. It's not worth it, even if you actually want to fight no matter what. So we're just going to withdraw it. Um, and you don't have any agency on, on the topic of how you defend your own country. Who do you think you are? I think that if we find ways to start not only withdrawing that aid, but being honest with uh, Ukraine and telling them we just aren't going to be able to get you the aid that you want. And even the levels you're currently yeah. getting are going to eventually start dropping. So you need to plan and make decisions about negotiations. with You know? What would cause less people to die? Because the Ukrainians have been doing extremely well with what they had. If you gave weapons faster, in bigger quantities, and also more, just more, more and faster, and not freeze aid. Those, those, those things would help to preserve more lives. Why does this person assume that if you withhold aid, just withdraw it, suddenly less people would die? That in mind, I think that that's the most responsible thing and the most positive thing that we can... Yes, the most responsible and positive thing would be to sell out God knows how many territories to occupation where people will be again killed, raped, tortured, possibly... Because we sure as hell don't have precedent for those sort of things in occupied regions. It's a mystery. Possibly do for the war. Even if if they want to, you know, keep fighting and... Def the chess master here, the teacher of English with his anecdotal friends. I think Hassan and others like him may not even see Ukrainians as Ukrainians. Perhaps, I don't know, lost or confused Russians. Who knows at this point of this talk? Tend themselves from attacks. God bless them. It's their right. But uh... 
God bless them, it's their right, until we say it's not, until we say we withdraw help and it's just, uh, yeah, we know better. But God bless you. Um, I, I, uh, I think that... But totally God bless you, right? Totally. Oh, totally, God bless you. We have a right to make decisions about what, how we want to be involved in this as well. So, um, I don't know, uh, here, here's, here's what I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think that perhaps if, uh, there was more training early on or more weapons delivered early on. I mean, that should have happened, but early on you were saying that Russia is just getting back its territory. So please. Please make up your mind. Because this is getting ridiculous. With proper aid, Ukraine can still win this outright. Maybe that there could have been a better defense planted, but the defense mm -hmm. was uh, relatively solid, all things considered, especially in comparison to like you know, 2014, I guess, and like what the Ukrainian military looked like at the time versus uh, what they were able to do in terms of like uh, uh, of, of uh, fending against like uh, Russian air superiority early yeah. on. And I um, like maybe there's a different timeline where like if the if the aid different. Oh, my God. It wasn't so uh, trickled. There you go, even you acknowledge that the aid was trickled. This is ridiculous. That, uh, from a pure military position, like, uh, there could have been even more leverage on the Ukrainian side. I don't know. I don't know how that would work. Cause I've Ukraine could... J oh. I feel like you still run into the, to the, uh, to the problem of, like, running out of people. Uh, I remember reading an assessment from uh, from this dude named Snake, I think. He's like some Ukrainian combat guy who was talking about how, like, it doesn't matter if there's one Russian guy sitting in a position. I mean, to be fair, there are other streamers that are very clearly pro-Ukrainian that go with the Kiev and not Kiev pronunciation. So I could cut him some slack on that. They're, they're pretty prominent streamers that pronounce it Kiev still. <laughs> It doesn't matter if we have drones. We don't know how many people are there. And if it's one fucking Russian dude and it's a rusty ass uh, and the, the one Russian conscript with a rusty ass fucking AK-47 is like holding a position, that's still dangerous for uh, our guys. And it holds yeah. us. Oh, it's our guys now. Now it's our guys. I'm talking about the Doni. Okay. 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 up it holds us up and it takes a tremendous amount of time even if it's one person now uh you know play that out across the board on the field everywhere oh well, let's listen to the military expert hassan piker if you play it out in the field then what in eastern ukraine and all of a sudden you arrive at the issue it's like uh it, in some ways it is in some ways, it does literally feel like a old school trench warfare or even like a, a war from a different era where, yes, uh, like manpower uh, yeah. in this circumstance, like the amount of people that you can throw at the problem in this circumstance does give you superiority uh, on the ground. No, that's actually incorrect. That is actually incorrect. It only gives you superiority when the other side is facing a critical shortage of ammunition. It can only work in these circumstances, in this, in these magical circumstances created by lack of aid. The problem is lack of aid. You're mistaken. Ukraine has been inflicting huge, huge losses on Russians while rationing Artillery shells, rationing, okay? Like, this cannot be serious. Like, 
we have to acknowledge, acknowledge that the, the term critical shortage is not just thrown around for memes, right? Um, yeah, there's there's that there's this old sort of conventional wisdom among military strategists that, you know, you, it takes seven people to get one person out of a defensive position. Yeah, that's how hard it is. Um, so, yes. Yeah, oh, whatever. Oh, it's such an uphill battle at this point. And I think that. Yeah, I think I think you have a good point that, you know, if you're going to intervene, uh, you want to do it early and you want to do it hard. Um, and but that's if your goal I, is, it, but that's if your goal, the reason why I brought this up, sorry to cut you off again, yeah, even though yeah, you're no, the no. guest here, but the reason no, why no. I brought it up is because that's only if your goal actually is to help Ukraine. Uh, if your goal yeah. is to extend the conflict as you, uh, one, make a tidy profit for the military industrial complex and very yeah. openly say, that uh, with 5% of our military budget, we were, we've been able to uh, destroy 50% of a foreign adversary's, uh, a foreign adversary's army. Actually, today, just today, in a new issue of a Polish magazine, I've heard uh, a new, totally new theory from a professor, a Polish professor of political sciences and I sin sinologist. I a professor of Chinese relations. So basically that person said that the reason why the West and especially the US never has went all in to just win against Russia and just finish it off. And keep in mind this is just a one theory of a single professor is that actually the plan of the U.S. is to weaken Russia and then actually use it as an ally against China. That's the reason, apparently. It's to just weaken Russia, then to offer to be allies, help it rebuild against Russia. China, sorry. So I've thrown this theory that I've read about today. I can even bring out the article and read in more detail the whole justification behind this theory, if you're interested, that is. I can bring it out. Just so you know what sort of theories are floating around when it comes to the topic of why exactly the West has, quote unquote, the West has not just thrown full blown aid and crushed Russia. Uh, with not a single active duty service member sound. dying in the process. I'm skeptical of this as well, personally. But it is a theory that has been thrown. If you, if anyone is interested, I, I can sort of read it out. But I don't think it's sound either, to be quite honest. Like the, the whole theory of that person is that uh, all countries are, are going away from burnable fuels like oil, etc. That China has already switched 50% of its energy to alternative sources and that basically uh, all countries will switch and Russia will end up with nothing and sitting on useless resources. That That's basically what the person pushing the theory that uh, the U.S. will want to use Russia against China is saying. Sea snake, serious. I hope most Americans know about the war more than Hassan. I have been internally screaming at this hack of knowledge on history and current. Oh, yeah. I know the feeling, Sea Snake series. I know the feeling. It's painful. Let me know, big boy. Crazy. Says if that is yeah. your actual goal, because it is a win-win from that perspective, uh, yeah. then yeah. And of course, the the person also said that Russia and China have an unsustainable relationship where 
China is basically draining Russia for oil and wood from Siberia. And that the relationship is unsustainable for Russia. Yeah, it's great. You trickle the weapons in slowly but surely. Okay, you yeah. give more of a comfortable runway to the American um, uh, defense contractors. And but I definitely don't think that Hassan's theory is sound, just so you know. Way, uh, so they don't like run out of resources. You recycle uh, older surplus military equipment into Ukraine, and then yeah. you can go back to the government and be like, well, our resources, are, our reserves are depleted. Now we need more money. And all of that drives the... It's like below one GDP, okay? It's far less than the U.S. has ever spent on any past conflict. Are we forgetting that? Is, is Hassan just pretending to be dumb here? Economy in the United States of America. And I think that that yeah. is the real American purpose here. That's why I always say uh, that that Ukraine is a just cause that America joined for, of course, the wrong reasons. Yeah, of course. America bad. I, we know America bad. Yeah, you I would say you always have to be <sighs> careful about attributing intent to these kind of dynamics. Um, Thank you. I, I agree with. Thank you for saying that you what is going on at this point where you know like the I, I don't agree by the way u.s definitely has a stake in drawing out this conflict for as long as possible uh especially because of the no no it doesn't actually it could get it could let uh ukraine win and then have many 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 lucrative deals with ukraine that would build up its defense and Europe's defense to make sure that Russia will never, ever be able to do anything like that again. This is just stupid. I'm sorry. You know, military contractor component and all of that. And the, but a thing is that they sort of fall into that logic a lot of times without even necessarily any particular person, you know, rubbing their hands and scheming to do so. It's just the thing. It's just in their genes. Where it, there are all these forces sort of pushing against the administration, really ramping up into a full blown uh, counteroffensive. Um, but then there are all these, uh, there's the MIC that's constantly lobbying for a continued presence in Ukraine. And sort of the way that those balance out end up extending the war in this horrible way and it works for the benefit of oh, capital yeah. absolutely um but you, you just always have to be careful about the us can sell ukraine all the expensive shiny toys like they did with poland exactly this theory makes absolutely no sense if you think about it for five seconds flat this just makes zero sense if you actually use your brain to think about it you don't need a drawn out conflict to make lucrative deals when you have Russia as your neighbor because you need deterrence and to have deterrence, you need to be armed, which means lucrative deals like, come on. Tribute. Poland is not in a conflict right now. Being intent there because oh. if you ask like any particular, mil like I, I'm sure that it I, I'm sure that Biden himself probably genuinely wants to get Russia out of Ukraine. Um, I think that he's probably thinking about it that way mm -hmm. and that it, whether whether he's actually willing to do what it takes uh, and whether he's being responsible. He is. He is willing to do what it takes. Do you know who is not willing to do what it takes? Mike Johnson, Donald Trump, the GOP. What are you fixating on? Biden, he's not the one freezing the aid. He's not the one blocking the aid. He's not the one going on recess for two weeks without even putting aid to vote in the House of Representatives. It's, it's not Biden doing that. It's not Biden. It's responsible about it and whether he has bad incentives pushing him into a bad course of action. 
that's a different story. But, you know, there are there are like a lot of true believers in this cause out there who really uh, are convinced that they're sort of fighting this World War Three against uh, Russian fascism. Um, and so which. Which they're. So what are they doing? I want to hear this. Which is all to say that I think early on in the war, uh, if you had actually been able to make the case, you know, hit them hard and fast immediately, I think that a lot of people in the administration would have uh, actually bought that. In fact, we know from some of the reporting that a lot of people, some of the reporting in the Biden administration were pushing for a much stronger response. And it was actually Biden who was a bit of a uh, well, they should have been listened to force of restraint at first. And I think that's probably kind of his role here still. Um, he's it, it, he's just sort of naturally falling into drawing this out because that's how these conflicts always end up going. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um I, I I the reason the reason I push back on that a little is because I see leftists walk into a trap a lot oh. of times where we talk about this kind of uh, perverse dynamic that capitalism pushes us into and we say we talk about this is what they intended or this is what they meant to do mm -hmm. and then it's very easy for the hawks and the liberals and so on to gotcha and be like you know who who split where's your evidence that they intended that like where do oh you have a recording God. of joe biden saying this like and yeah. so it, what ends up happening is you start trying to do the this dot connecting yeah, stuff it's not about asserting the situation it's about the traps that would await leftists it's that's what it's all about of course as always that's the most important thing. Where you're like, well, we made this... Uh, well, Joe Biden did say it, to be fair. Like, he openly mentioned it uh, as he was, like, trying to sell the aid package, the $95 billion aid package, like, uh, last week, or, or a couple days uh, ago, actually, as it passed through the Senate, where he openly said, like, you guys don't understand, we're not, like, dropping, you know, bags of cash into Ukraine. Okay. We're actually, yeah. like, this money is going back to our weapons, uh, our, our facilities. I mean, it like, is. This money is... Hiring more American. It, it is. A lot of it is. And a lot of it is used to keep the economy of Ukraine afloat. Hands. And this was oh, yeah, actually yeah, yeah, yeah. a calculated messaging effort that uh, was leaked to Politico by the Biden camp, I suspect. Uh, I yeah. Well, I, we've heard a few conspiracy theories today. Zoom. Uh, uh, maybe like a month prior, I remember reading an article about this specifically on how to sell the idea of weapons. Listening to these guys is not much more informative than listening to Joe Rogan or a Russia brand. Yeah. Weapons aid to the American public because it is true. And I don't think yeah. it's a conspiracy in the sense that like it's a conspiracy theory. I think it's a conspiracy in the, in the truest sense of the word. They are conspiring because we are all oh, for fuck's sake. Lined on, uh, I mean, I think they're aligned on class interests in this situation. Yeah, it's just like it, I can't believe what I'm hearing. It's 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 a normal collaboration. It's the same. It's the same thing that like uh, I guess Noam Chomsky talks about quite frequently with respect to uh, people that get we elevated just go, into positions. Go, we might just go and say whatever without any evidence. We can just say anything. into higher and higher positions in uh, American media, they would not be there. there. There's no, like, deliberate attempt Yeah. where someone well, goes, I know what I'm saying is untrue, and that's why I'm saying it. Uh, it's more, or someone gave me orders to say these things. It's not, a, it's not a conspiracy theory in that sense. It's more so they do genuinely believe it, and their interests yeah. do align, mm, and yeah. therefore, you know, they, yeah. they advocate for these things.
I think I think we're agreeing. Um, yeah. I think that I, I think that I, I'm just always that does tend to happen when you bring in a yes man to your stream to agree with you. That does tend to happen, unfortunate as it is. Sort of reflexively, like every time I hear somebody start talking about intents and especially like secret intents, I get a little nervous because I it, this is just like the liberal playbook where every single time that you start doing that, they gotcha on that. Or it's like it, you see the same thing that happens a lot of times. Again, it's not about ascertaining what's true or not. It's about avoiding gachas with your conspiracy theories. Times when you have journalists who are very clearly hawks and who have very obvious mm -hmm. conflicts of interest in the way that they talk about. Can you name them? Name those journalists. Don't be a coward. Name them. Name the hawks. Who are the hawks according to you? and cover this war and so you know people sort of colloquially say uh, colloquially say well they're bought off you know or they're they're in the bag or whatever and they are in in this informal sense that you're talking about but if you actually put it that way they always come back and say oh you you actually think that i'm getting paid by zelensky to say this where's your proof you know they do yeah. that kind of stuff but, i mean it's not it's not so zelensky not. you might say that about anyone even independent journalists this is ridiculous name them or just don't talk about it name the bot journalists <laughs> are they hawks or liberals are the two the same are both in the room with you right now? Literally. Name the journalists. Name those bot journalists. Let me guess. Are they perhaps psychopathic perverts? By any chance? It's, it, it, are those included in those bot off journalists? Any yeah. instances is like directly Raytheon. You have a yeah. former general yeah. go on CNN and do yeah. a PowerPoint presentation on High Mars, and yeah. and very openly, uh, you look at their you look at their background and they're just straight up like they're doing lobbying for Raytheon actively while they're live on TV, yeah. uh, talking about uh, their perspective on the war as though it's like uh, as though they have no other nefarious secondary reason for saying the things that they are saying and I that makes no sense i'm sorry what's the nefarious thing uh yeah. in my opinion that is like you know the, that's the when i say someone's bought off that's what i mean in the, yeah, in the most yeah. reductive terms um regardless yeah. though yeah like i said it's a it's the entire system is designed in this way whether it's ukraine whether it's Taiwan, whether Ukraine. it is uh, whether it's Israel or uh, anywhere else where America is involved in the affairs of, uh, of it's not just first of all it's not just uh, the U.S. So it's, it this just makes no sense. Like the entirety of Europe would need to be in on this, and Europe is already contributing more than the U.S. in absolute numbers. Does Hassan think that countries buy HIMARS because they saw it on CNN? Yes. And no other reason. Another country involving itself or greatly accelerating tensions, trying to start conflict. Ah, uh, yes. It's, it's, pff, of course, it's, it was the U.S. that accelerated the tensions and caused the invasion to begin with. Oh, how could I have forgotten that actually it was the U.S. that invaded Russia or something? I, pff, silly me. all uh it's it, it's all at the behest of the the uh profit margins for weapons uh, yes it's like russia uh, china india all their all of them are just pawns for the profit margin of the u.s like the u.s is the ultimate puppeteer it basically just caused this whole war on its own like how deluded can you be about the whole 
America bad thing? How far can you go in this mindset for it just gets so ridiculous? Uh, you know, for, for defense contractors in general. Um, yeah. Now, yeah. moving away from uh, the things like the peace uh, negotiations, I, I do want to... Oh talk yeah. a little bit more about like where we're at at this point because the counteroffensive uh finally indonesia malaysia philippines vietnam communist nay taiwan it's uh, all the pounds of the u.s in the south china of course uh, at this stage is 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 an abject failure um this was yeah. propped up and 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 sold to the american public for those who are still interested in ukraine uh, or we're still interested in Ukraine. A lot of people are still interested in Ukraine. Have you seen the polls, the newest ones? What do you mean, who were still interested in Ukraine? This guy is so... Do some basic prep. Sort of. I, I'm pretty sure at this point it's both. I'm pretty sure it's both in relative and absolute numbers. If you if you take all of the aid by the entirety of European Union put together, I'm pretty sure the European Union has actually uh, contributed in total more in absolute numbers as well. I mean, we would we might need to check it, but I'm pretty sure that is the case. I'm talking about if you sum up the entirety of the aid of the entirety of the European Union. Uh, uh, sure maybe, you know, like, six months ago. I'm pretty sure the, you might have outdone, but maybe you should just look at the data. I know in relative terms, certainly, but in absolute terms. Might have made a mistake here, but I know that in relative terms for sure. Now, curiously enough, huh? Does anybody have a graph? These numbers. Okay. Yeah, Lucy, didn't you know that Russia's ambitions to raise for resurrecting its empire is all caused by America? True, it is. So, also, if you're gonna give where, links, give uh, it in this the was going to be... White Forest page. It won't work on YouTube. Uh, an active effort to completely rid the, the Eastern territories uh, of, of any kind of Russian invasion, and it failed. And now it's a, it's a cold stalemate with, uh, yeah. as, as many people suspected, uh, with like, you know, Russia every now and then bombing uh, Western positions and uh, and, and Ukraine bombing even uh, inside of Russia every now and then. Uh, and and it's it's just like pot shots at this point. Minefields. Yeah. Uh, there is yeah. a need for artillery. Uh, yeah, a critical need for artillery. You know, we call it a critical shortage in shells. A lot of those munitions uh, we are, uh, I guess, running out of because... I, I, because of the fact that like we don't we just don't have like a straight up World War II style war economy where every single resource is going directly into building weapons. So yeah. uh, But it's true for Europe, but the US does have a lot of shells. Are you kidding me? Are you saying that the US ran out of shells?
Is that what you're trying to sell us right now, Hassan Piker? That the U.S. has run out of shells to give Ukraine? That this is... This is incredible. I know that the Europe that Europe cannot keep up with production when compared to like what Russia is getting from North Korea, etc. But the US has not run out of shells. Uh, now you also have now you also have uh Israel. He's making that argument. He's making the argument that the lack of shells by Ukraine is caused by the U.S. lacking shells to give? Again, stupid take after stupid take after stupid take relentlessly. And they need uh, dumb bombs as well. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, you know, this was even before uh, October 7, where uh, America had to tap in uh, to South Korea, uh, a nation with a lot of uh, artillery for obvious reasons, um, yeah. to, to uh, basically resupply Ukraine. And that was, and then after Israel's uh, uh, ethnic cleansing campaign began. There are 4 million cluster munitions that could be given to Ukraine alone. Four million. Four million shells that could be given. Lucy seems you were correct, and the EU, uh, EU sum total is larger than the US. I thought so. Some things were low on ammo. From what I remember, the absolute numbers I have seen uh, tend to put us higher because of the donation based on original production. Cause, but in relative terms, it's dwarfed by you countries. I think it's, I think at this point, even if you take into consideration what the US did with the whole cost thing, it's still bigger in Europe. Post October 7, now our attention has shifted over there and our resources have shifted over there. So Ukraine is in a really. Also, the US has a pretty robust, uh, like, defense industry it's it it can definitely produce shells a lot it's like the us is not in the situation of europe as far as i know really bad position now yeah yeah um i, th I if, if if what i would sort of say is i think that the number one problem that's going to face ukraine in the end is frozen aid by the GOP and lack of munition, critical lack of munition. That's going to be the number one problem. And it's already here. It's not a problem that Ukraine will face in the future. It's the, it's the problem that Ukraine's facing now. And is actually domestic. Um, I think that the conscription issue is i don't think that's the biggest issue i'm gonna be honest i do not think that is the number one biggest issue we you know what it is aid much more politically destabilizing than people really get at this point but you can see it um and it's not by the way just coming from people avoiding uh, being conscripted. It's also on the other side, you have uh, families of soldiers who've been there from the beginning complaining and saying, you know, they've been fighting all this time. They should be able to take some time off while all these other people who've been home all the time go out and fight. Uh, so this is like the war is really coming home in that sense uh to ukraine where it's it's becoming more and more difficult for your average ordinary person to hide from it or people are not mass hiding from the war your anecdotes have not supported that your anecdotes have not demonstrated that people are just mass hiding from conscription from being soldiers that there's this, show me data don't give me your friends show me data on that I want to see some evidence for your claim because you keep referencing people hiding. This is getting ridiculous.
teacher. No, YouTube did not let it through. I told you if you want to put links, put it in the white, white forest page. To get away from it, you know, you could sort of move out like west. People are not mass getting away from it. It is a problem, but it is not a mass problem. Actually, people mass running away was what Russia assumed would happen. And, that, and that's why they assumed they would take Ukraine in three days or whatever, because they assumed everybody would run and hide. I mean, this, this has been home since 2014, arguably. That came home to all Ukrainians, even those Hungarian speakers in Western... Yeah, exactly. Like, this is so ridiculous. This is... I don't even know how to comment on this. Ukraine support tracker. Uh, okay. Where is it? <sighs> yeah. There we go. Government support Ukraine, type of assistant, billion. Estonia, Denmark. And where's Poland? I don't even see Poland on this list. No, wait, there, there it is, Poland. The Foreign Forum was absolutely already involved with massive amount of Ukrainians, I agree. They forgot how serious it was in 2022. Yeah. Like, this is just below parody. Yeah. A bit. Like the, I, I, I hate this bit about people hiding. I could give so many anecdotes about people going out of their way to go to Ukraine to fight. Come on, like I hate this. How he's building this narrative of people cannot hide anymore because people are just mass hiding. Obviously, it or you could flee the country. And, you know, if you were like, say, uh, in Lvov or something like that, you might still face the occasion. Lvov? Wait, what is this sort of Polish, like, hybrid pronunciation? What's up with this? Well, Lvov? Missile flying a bit, or you could flee the country. And, you know, if you were like, say, uh, in Lvov or something. Lvov? Damn. Like that, you might Polish still face vibe. the occasional missile flying Almost air, the wolf. over there. But it was relatively sort of a stable situation. It's weird to me that people still think of him as a leftist. This content is as bad as Tucker Carlson. I, I'm not even going to argue that. I get there are other economic problems and stuff like that. But I think that ultimately it's just a meat grinder there at the front lines uh yeah a russian meat grinder and if Lviv, Lviv already has been attacked several times bombing of course people in ukraine want to hide this whole narrative about people just hiding whatever they can in their little holes is such misinformation it's it's like bordering propaganda it's Lvov in russian only in ukrainian it's not damn interesting interesting choice of nomenclature i'll say that much very interesting choice of nomenclature from our expert guest who was a teacher.
I love Voff. Uh, if they can't just keep sending, they can't keep raising the conscription age ceiling, and you know, pick, sort of scraping the bottom of the barrel. More. The what do you mean? What do you mean raising? That that's not what's happening. The point is not to raise the age of conscription. It, the the actual aim is to conscript more younger people. 25 year olds or something like that that's 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 the goal not to right where did you get this idea from that the age of conscription is going to be raised yes yeah, 60 year olds are going to be conscripted that's the plan to win yeah from yeah I believe you've had been bombed from early on like come on i've never heard this more and more putting prisoners out there and stuff like that. Or are you talking about Russia? Um, You're talking about Russia, right? Prisoners. That that's Russia is doing that. Okay, he's talking about Russia. Never mind. Eventually, it's going to turn into a political problem where you have people running on either ending conscription, which will end the war, or just flat out ending the war itself. Wait, who is he talking about? It's conscription prisoners. That... Uh, for the simple reason that it's just hurting Ukrainians, ordinary Ukrainians. Wait, wait, hold on. Did he just say Ukraine wants to raise conscription age and conscript prisoners? I, I want to see some data on that. I know that Russia is conscripting prisoners and mass. But Ukraine? I'd like to see some data. Not anecdotes about people hiding and personal opinions. Too much. And I think that that is probably a more likely uh, settlement. At this point, I don't think Zelensky is really in a position where he can settle uh, now. I just don't because the the politics of it, the way that the right has him over a barrel and it will just. The right, the right's not even a significant power in Ukraine right now from what I know. Oh, yeah, the right has such a tight grip over Zelensky. The right, the ever present right wing in Ukraine.